Good afternoon and welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gilla, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. So happy to have you with us for today's program. I wanna thank and acknowledge Laura Peer, my friend and colleague, who's the Training Manager for the International Center for Child Health and Development. Laura is gonna be helping to moderate the chat, uh, representing you as the program goes on and we have time for some questions and answers. Um, for our audience joining us on Zoom, I just wanna make sure you're aware that you're, you're muted. We cannot see or hear you. We also cannot call on raised hands. However, the chat feature is enabled and we really wanna encourage people to join in this conversation. You can send in comments just to the panel or if there's something that you'd like to share with the full room, you could send it to all panelists and attendees. I want to um, also greet our friends on YouTube. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to directly interact with you as this program goes, but we're super happy that you're with us. So before we get started uh, with today's program, I just want to let you know what's coming up this week um, on Open Classroom. We have another program tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, Dr. David Curiel is going to be speaking to us. This is the final installment of our series on the COVID vaccine. And the program tomorrow is really going to talk about the science-driven decisions in developing uh, the vaccine. I'll be joined with Associate Dean for Public Health, Rodrigo Riaz, um, for a conversation that really gets to some of the technical questions that we may have. Um, finally, an expert who hopefully can answer them for us. And then we're back on on Thursday, excuse me, March the 25th, Dr. Sarah Moreland Russell is going to be talking to us about theories of policy change. This is offered in partnership with the Brown School's Policy Scholars Program. So great things coming up and great things happening today. And to get that started, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mary McKay, who is the Nidor Family and Centene Corporation Dean of the Brown School. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. So thank you, Janet. Thank you for your leadership from professional development, for organizing us on Open Classroom, and for really connecting with all of you, whether you're on Zoom or YouTube or will be watching us um, after uh, Dr. Gain gives his presentation um, online. So it's my job to welcome you uh, to the Brown School. I have the privilege of being the dean here. Um, this is a school that really emphasizes the integration and the excellence in social work, public health, and social policy. Um, I also also have the privilege of welcoming you from two really important centers within the Brown, uh, Brown School, ICHAD and the Smart Africa Center. These are two extraordinary groups of scientists um, that really are deeply committed to furthering knowledge about how to improve the circumstances for young people, their families on the continent of Africa. Um, and, and so my colleague, Dr. Osge, will introduce our speaker in just a minute. But the last kind of set of acknowledgements that I, I wanna make about iChat and Smart Africa is we're deeply committed to creating a pipeline of scholars that care about the continent, those from the continent directly as well as those from the US. And, and Laura, thank you for all that you do to support and elevate our training programs. Um, we're incredibly grateful for your leadership as well. So with that, um, you're in for a real treat. Um, Elvin is an amazing colleague at Washington University. We are thrilled to have you here at our university and for you talking on, uh, uh, on behalf of our African Speaks um, collaboration. I do wanna acknowledge that, that we have a, a robust global set of programs at the university level, at the Brown School. And so, so we're grateful for Vice Chancellor Kirk Dirks, uh, Bill Powderly, who is the Institute for Public Health Director, all of whom have played a role in, in this uh, convening today. So with that, Dr. Osge, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our terrific speaker. Thank you all, thank you. Hi everybody, welcome. My name is Elsge. I'm I'm faculty at the Brown School and also one of the co-directors for iChat. And I have the pleasure of introducing to you today our our um, our amazing um, speaker, Dr. Gang, who is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine, and also the director of the Center for Dissemination and Implementation at the Institute for Public Health um, here at Washington University in St. Louis. He earned his MD and MPH degrees from Columbia University and completed his postdoctoral training um, at Rucker, Rockefeller University and the fellowship in infectious diseases at the University of California, San Francisco. 
um, he uses the lens of implementation science to conduct research um, that optimizes the use of evidence-based interventions in the public health response to um, HIV. And his work is carried out through collaborations in, in Kenya, Zambia, Uganda, as well as in the United States. His current projects make use of a range of observational mixed methods, quasi-experimental experimental methods, and um, his work is sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as National Institutes of Health. And with that, um, I will pass it to you, um, Dr. Gang. Thank you. Um, and um, just a, a real pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, and uh, we'll dive right in. I'm happy to try and you know scan the uh, chats and or uh, listen out for um, queries and signals as we go. Um, but again, just a real pleasure to be here. And thank you, um, uh, Osge and Mary, for those uh, nice intro introductory words. Um, so let me share my screen and um, so I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about adaptive interventions and uh, related to the field that I work on, the applied field that I work on, which is engagement in HIV services, um, mostly with colleagues and um, uh, collaborators uh, through, throughout um, sort of many settings, but, but in particular, I'm privileged to work with folks from um, from Africa in a lot of this work. Um, and I wanna use this as an opportunity to talk about a particular scientific approach, but also to um, try and recapitulate for you all a little bit of my own sort of scientific journey through this um, to give you a sense of, I think, how um, um, some of the work that I'm doing evolved over time uh, and, and how uh, perhaps a, a window, a small window into um, sort of some dimensions of the, the the scientific professional process that that takes some some time to to unfold uh, that I certainly didn't uh, perceive when I was getting started. Um, let me start by a couple of disclosures. I do have funding from the NIH and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I have an educational grant from Vive Healthcare. Um, and uh, for the work at hand that I'm going to talk about today. I uh, just want to acknowledge my close collaborators um, in this work, uh, Dr. Thomas Odeni, who is a research scientist at Kemri in Kenya, um, has been a friend and a, and, a, and a close colleague for many years, um, and Dr. Elizabeth Bukusi, who's a, a well-known leader in, in science in Kenya, um, as well as uh, Maya Peterson, who is a statistician, a biostatistician um, at UC Berkeley in, in California. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about adaptive interventions, not adaptive designs or trials, which are sometimes confused with adaptive interventions. Um, I'm going to use challenges in HIV service delivery um, in the global public health setting uh, to look for and, and, and try and identify sort of conserved underlying features of problems that seem distinct uh, on the surface. Um, and I'm going to argue that some of these conserved features are in fact shared by many different uh, public health programming challenges in general, uh, that many of these are well suited for um, amelioration or addressing with adap adaptive interventions. Um, I'm gonna talk, as I said before, a little bit about my scientific journey in engagement and retention research. Um, and then I'm gonna uh, get a little bit more specific in the discussion of sequential multiple assignment randomized trials for developing adaptive interventions. I'll touch on some of the practicalities and limitations of this approach um, and end with a little bit of uh, more blue skies conjecture about what um, these methods may mean for public health and whether or not um, a, a, a somewhat personalized public health uh, might actually be not a, uh, a contradiction or a paradox, but, but um, perhaps a, an innovative way to think about the next generation of public health practice. So let me start with a couple of cases, um, just to keep things real. Uh, this is um, um, taken uh, sort of from an amalgamation of, of real cases from um, sort of practice in San Francisco, where I, 
where I did clinical practice for, for many years. Um, you know, this is from the perspective of a primary care provider. Um, you know, at 11 a.m. that day, um, you have somebody, a patient who's been added to your to your list at the last minute, a 45 year old man living with HIV. Uh, he's going to be seeing you're going to be seeing this gentleman in half an hour. You've never met him before. You scan his chart quickly. Uh, he's got a relatively low CD4 count, which means some but not um, marked immune compromise, a high viral load indicating uh, that the person is not being treated for HIV, um, lives in a shelter, has a substance use disorder, carries a, a mental health diagnosis, and um, is missing uh, identification. Uh, you meet the gentleman, you spend about 15 minutes getting to know him as a person and you you know you try to rule out some acute medical issues like is there something really emergent going on um, and then and then you have to ask yourself some questions and I think these are the kinds of questions that public uh, that primary care providers not restricted to HIV but in HIV would ask themselves um, commonly so what do you do in the next 15 minutes do you start uh, HIV treatment do you try to address the psychiatric illness do you focus on making sure that the patient has insurance um, when do you turn your attention to other issues? after the resolution of the first issue or you know, by the next visit, you'll for sure sort of address the next one. Um, and, and does the order matter? Um, you know, I think um, some uh, practitioners might feel strongly that they should tr address the psychiatric issues first uh, and then the other ones. Um, other providers may feel differently. So um, there is potentially a lot at stake in some of these choices that are embedded in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Um, I'm gonna give another example, um, which I think has some of the same underlying conserved features, but take this up one notch in the socio-ecologic scale and describe a clinic. Let's say you, you um, direct an HIV clinic and you wanna start a performance improvement program. You get a report of your clinic and you find that, um, you know, 85 year percent of your patients are rally suppressed, meaning they're doing well from an HIV point of view, but only 50% of the hypertensive patients are doing well. Uh, and then you're not doing that well with substance use disorders. Um, the payer system will pay for, uh, based on quality indicators starting um, in, in, in the new fiscal year, but you will be given a budget for performance improvement. So what will you do? How should you decide to um, decide between different interventions that you believe have evidence behind them? So quality improvement, evidence-based intervention? Do you start a quality improvement program? Do you hire a consultant to work with workflow? Do you use audience feedback with specific clinicians? Um, or do you try to pay for performance? Um, each of these things um, has some evidence for it. Um, how will you decide which ones to use and in what order? Finally, I'm gonna end with um, another case. This is from uh, work, qualitative work that um, uh, we were involved in Uganda a number of years ago. For those of you who've worked on HIV, treatment um, in the global south, this kind of story is not, um, uh, is, is going to be not unfamiliar. 35-year-old woman, enrolled in care, doing well, misses a scheduled appointment because uh, a relative passed and she traveled to attend the burial. Um, that travel meant that she missed her uh, appointment and then um, borrowed enough money to come back to clinic after some period of absence. Uh, was told that, you know, not a clinic day, uh, not seeing patients come back next week. Um, by the time, she, the next time she came back, the clinic sort of um, um, uh, scolded her for being late. And then she had an argument with the, with the staff and decided to stop coming back. Um, and this is a quote from, from uh, her. Uh, at times you've missed your appointment date. And when you come back, the doctor looks at you with such a bad eye that you fear explaining more. She tells you, stop disturbing me. Today is not your appointment date. She stands and walks away. At times, I do not blame them. Maybe they are hungry or tired. If they could start providing lunch to the doctors, uh, maybe this would help. So um, a complex, I, I think that quote from the, um, uh, the patient um, really is quite telling um, because it tells us so much about not only the experience of her as a patient and a human, but also the multifactorial issues um, that, that affect um, the delivery of public health services that vary from, you know, challenges that she had um, to a recognition that the healthcare system is overstretched and the healthcare workers are, 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 are sort of um, um, tired and perhaps morale is not particularly high, uh, leading to, to, to sort of such um, um, issues and outcomes.
But nevertheless, um, I'm going to pose this sort of thought exercise for you. Um, these cases all seem somewhat dissimilar, different contexts, um, perhaps, but but many, but they share um, some, uh, you know, underlying features that that are actually um, not that different from each other. And I'm going to spend the next um, bit of the talk trying to uh, articulate what those features are, um, and then. And, and then talk about how perhaps they're common throughout many different kinds of public health issues. Um, in talking about the response to these issues, though, um, um, I think we, we'll, this is where we'll get into sort of the idea of adaptive interventions, which are a way to address these kinds of issues. Um, and, 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 then, and then finally into sort of um, formal methods for, for studying these kinds of uh, adaptive interventions. But before I get into <clears throat> those more theoretical um, um, uh, or conceptual uh, pieces of the discussion, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about my own sort of research journey in HIV and call attention to the sort of insights um, that we developed along the way that brought us to this point of, of, of sort of being interested in adaptive interventions and, and adaptation more generally. So um, for those of you who, who, who don't know, um, um, one, of the, one of the major public health threats um, to the world in the last generation has been uh, the, the HIV pandemic. This is a figure taken from the World Bank um, illustrating uh, life expectancies in regions of Africa where the um, HIV epidemic was has has been um, um, has been most severe, and um, as you can see here, you know from the 60s and 70s to 80s to 90s, a steady upward um, rise in life expectancy um, in most places in in eastern and southern Africa, uh, and then as the HIV epidemic took off uh, in the in the 90s and early 2000s, a, a real plummeting in, in life expectancy. And I think, you know, um, this really speaks to the extent to which uh, that epidemic um, influenced society at large in, in many places in, in Africa. Um, you'll also see here that uh, by the early 2010s, when treatment became more widely available, a rise back in life expectancy um, and perhaps on track to catch up to the um, old, the tra tra trajectory before mm -hmm. HIV. Um, in my my sort of um, research world, I, I was a fellow and a sort of a budding um, researcher in infectious diseases at the time in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, when HIV treatment was becoming widely available globally, 2005 and 2006, um, due to uh, a lot of due to investments from both national governments in Africa as well as um, as well as international donors, and 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 my uh, sort of um, research uh, was at the time focused on this idea of looking at patients who are lost from the system. So as you know, there were uh, in order to treat large numbers of people, um, public health clinics were set up throughout Africa, and many people got on treatment. Um, but there were also a lot of people who, you know, touched the system, but then eventually sort of dropped out of the system or disappeared from the system. And and so um, the thought that w that um, sort of we had about this was, w well, maybe we can study those folks um, and develop an understanding of why they dropped out. Um, who who are the subgroups that are most likely to drop out? When do they fall out of care? Where 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 is this happening? Um, sort of more or less, and. And what are their real outcomes? Where do they go? Um, do they go to other clinics? Do they do, have many of them died, et cetera? Um, as a way of understanding uh, limitations of the system and then um, methods of improvement. Um, so um, this is a, a, a picture of George Bush um, and Mark Dybel who under the Bush administration started PEPFAR, uh, which is the United States government's sort of investment in global HIV treatment led by Mark Dybel, who's the first director 
of, of PEPFAR. Um, and this is sort of the context in the, in the mid 2000s of, of, of the research that I'm talking about. Um, we applied relatively simple sort of epidemiological principles to these, um, to these studies. Uh, we know that at a given healthcare unit and many, many thousands of healthcare units sprung up, there were, you know, thousands of patients starting treatment and, and some proportion would be lost to follow up. And, um, if, a, if there's a clinic of 10,000 people and, you know, 20% get lost to follow up, that's 2000 people, which is a, a lot. And, you know, sort of understanding that we could perhaps not, um, you know, sort of neither programs nor research could look for everybody, um, sort of take a random sample of those, spend a lot of time and energy trying to find out what happened to them um, and use those outcomes, both in formal epidemiologic analyses uh, with probability ways to represent sort of all outcomes, as well as just conceptually to, to try and develop um, a representative understanding of, a, of, a, of the population of people that are falling out of care. Um, and in that work, um, which was done with collaborators in the IDEA consortia um, in, in, in Uganda and Kenya and, and Tanzania and other places, um, you know, um, in, in sort of looking for lost patients from, you know, dozens of clinics, um, a, rep, a, a, a representative sample, we developed certain sort of realizations as we as we went. Not, not all these are, are sort of rocket science, but I'm presenting them here to <clears throat> try and um, artic argue that these, that there are sort of underlying common um, um, uh, issues and barriers, despite the fact that we're talking about a lot of different contextual settings. So number one, and this one kind of goes without saying, not everyone needs help, even if a large proportion of people do, right? So there's a heterogeneity in terms of the, the, the nature of need. Um, these are two clinics. These are taken from Zambia. And um, we classified people after two years of follow-up in a larger clinic with about 6,000 people in a smaller clinic with about 3,000 people. And um, just to illustrate that, like if you just take the example on the left here, you know, half of people were um, alive and and always in care. So after two years of follow up, they've always been, they've always made all their appointments, they've picked up their meds on time every time, so, and they're doing, you know, they're doing very well. Now, that's probably about, you know, um, 40, 50 percent of of many different clinics. Um, then there's another chunk of people here, 20 percent that we put in orange here that were alive um, in, in, in care, but with a history of lapses and missed visits. So, so perhaps not doing quite as well as the, the dark blue, but you know, um, reasonably retained in care. And then there's another sort of chunk of people that are out of care, <clears throat> and then some who have died and some who have transferred. But I, I think to illustrate here is just number one, that um, people have, have varied in, um, outcomes and that that variation varies by facility. Um, this is a, a study where we looked at these outcomes again over the course of two years in five different settings um, in, in Eastern Africa. Embarara is in Uganda, Kisumu um, is in um, Kenya, Morogoro, uh, Tanzania, and then Eldoret again back to Kenya and Kampala in, in Uganda. And, and you know, without belaboring the details, if you just bring your attention to the last bar here, um, the 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 outcomes at two years are are quite varied between different uh, settings and facilities, um, even though <clears throat> um, there there are uh, some similarities. Um, and I'll return to that idea that not everybody needs help when we get to um, the 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 adaptive intervention idea. Okay, so for those who need help, um, we documented and, and again this is 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 um, probably anticipatable that those who need help need different kinds of help so um, among lost to follow patients um, you know our, our our team working with peer uh, educators and and peer service delivery um, folks at facilities would look for patients who are lost and and ask them questions including sort of you know basically why didn't you come back and we would quote, we would code the results. And, and this is a sample from a, from a setting in, in Zambia. Um, and you can see 
a couple of things. Number one, there are lots of different reasons. Um, many of these are anticipatable and common. The most prevalent reason is work requirements interfered with picking up medications or visit visiting clinic. Um, other ones were, I spent too much time at clinic, I moved and there was no available care, work interfered with taking my, med with taking my medications in my possession, um, et cetera. And, um, and, and here we've color coded them according to sort of blue, um, red and yellow for the domains, structural, you know, related to the conditions of life, clinical related to the health system and psychosocial related to um, sort of psychological and social health. But, um, but number one, lots of different types of problems. Um, and again, as illustrated before, uh, when shown across clinics, again, this is work um, with CIDRs um, in Zambia, um, that um, um, the, the, the differences uh, differ by facility. So um, if you just look at the far left sort of square here, each row is a clinic um, and the colors represent different types of patient reported reasons for not having gone back to that clinic. Um, and, and you can see that you know a structural reason was invoked by anywhere from nearly 100% of patients to less than 20% across the clinics. Um, so illustrating again, a heterogeneity of needs and a heterogeneity of needs both um, within and between facilities. Um, at the individual patient level, <clears throat> um, we we also sort of um, found this heterogeneity in the uh, number and types of needs that patient reported. So when patients said that they could not come back for X, Y, or Z reasons, they could obviously report more than one. And this is a Venn diagram uh, uh, of, of work, again, in Zambia, where um, we overlapped the reasons. And you can see that you know, a good chunk say they had structural reasons only. Another chunk said only psychosocial reasons. Um, some had two and a few uh, reported all three. So different um, types as well as um, levels of, of potential need in terms of a retention in HIV treatment um, agenda. Now, um, <clears throat> Um, for for the problem of engagement in care uh, in HIV, but also for many behavioral issues, um, um, there are evidence-based interventions. But but in general, there are no silver bullets, and and few interventions have large effects. So, for HIV engagement, um, you know, there have been many many randomized trials conducted for a whole bunch of behavioral interventions. I just took a snapshot here uh, at the top. Um, a randomized trial of cash incentives for uptake of voluntary male, me male medical circumcision. In the middle here, SMS for um, uh, postpartum um, mother to child transmission testing uh, and retention. Um, and then in the bottom here, viral load suppression in adult patients in Kenya. Each of these studies had statistically significant primary outcomes, <clears throat> but in all cases, you can see that the effect sizes are not sort of very large and in some cases quite small. Um, another feature uh, of one's response for the public health problems that we've talked about here um, is that uh, you sort of can't do everything at once, even if there are evidence-based interventions um, that we just perhaps touched on. Um, that there's all, there are generally limitations to doing everything at once. There are timing issues. Um, if you go back to the very first case that we talked about, you can't sort of treat substance abuse, mental illness, HIV, and deal with insurance all at the same time because there are time constraints. There are costs. Um, we can't uh, invoke uh, every intervention for every patient um, every time. Uh, in the global HIV treatment situation, there is uh, a, a probably a a, a budget envelope for the entire sort of public health response that, that's not likely to change much in the near future. Uh, it, it, you know, if anything, it might shrink, but, but unlikely to expand. Um, and even if you could pay for uh, things, um, it would be, um, you know, not every healthcare worker has the ability to deliver every kind of intervention. So, so there's reasons to, um, <clears throat> That, that you can't sort of do everything all at once. Um, two more briefly here, again, 
uh, situations that apply to each of those um, scenarios at the beginning, but can't tell who will respond to what, right? So even if there are evidence-based interventions for, you know, retention, such as an you know an SMS or a small cash transfer, you 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 can't tell ahead of time who would respond to 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 what, um, and um, and for example, you know we know that uh, a cash transfer might improve. Um, some engagement, uh, a small amount, but there's no sort of marker ahead of time that would say who that that person who would respond is. Okay, my last point here about interventions complex for complex behavioral uh, based issues is that we can't tell how interventions that we would deliver would interact and how they interact, I'm gonna call uh, provisionally this term mosaic effectiveness. Um, and let me explain what that is. So if you have some behavioral intervention, perhaps it's an SMS uh, that we'll call intervention A and perhaps counseling uh, or something like that is intervention B, and you know that half of people respond to A and maybe a quarter of people respond to B, you, you don't, there, it's not obvious how A and B would, um, what kind of effects they would have if, if both of them were delivered. Because you could be in a situation uh, on the top right here where the responders to B are the same people who would have responded to A, in which case, if you deliver them together, you would just get 50% response. Or if you were to deliver B alone, uh, sorry, A and B together, it could be that the responders to B are those who did not respond to A, and therefore uh, A plus B together would get you um, much higher coverage uh, than either uh, by themselves. <clears throat> but it's often difficult to know um, in any given combination of interventions who, wh whether or not their effects will be sort of like redundant as above or, or additive as below. Um, um, so I cover I covered this a little bit, um, but regarding, um, you know, uh, the applied example of of HIV retention, um, let's say cash transfers and and SMSs, you know, we 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 don't know number one how they will work together, and we also don't know um, how to string them together, right? So do you do one and add the second one to people who are not responding, or or reverse that? Um, so in short, um, for um, engagement in HIV services are some example, some sort of um, it, observations were, were that people actually need different levels of need, that they require different types of help, um, that many evidence-based interventions exist, but because they work by different mechanisms and the mechanisms of non-retention are diverse, there are no silver bullets. Um, and you can't do everything at once. And indeed the sequence may matter. Uh, you can't tell who will respond to what and you can't tell how they will interact. So these, these constraints, these features, um, point to, I think, um, a, a fundamental structure of, of a shared scientific question. And what is that question? Well, it's not um, efficacy. It's, it's obviously not whether A works versus nothing, right? Like um, we know that different people have different needs and that different people respond to different things. So that's not, in any one thing alone is, is, is not gonna be sufficient to make a big difference, I think, on a population level. Um, it's also not comparative effectiveness. You don't just wanna compare sort of A and B and B and C and C and D and try to see which one is the most effective because number one, none of them are gonna be all that effective. And number two, uh, you'd want to know how they would work together rather than whether or not one is better than the other. Um, um, and, um, and, and so um, the, the, what, where that leaves us is, is really what we would, would like to know um, is, is how to assemble a strategy made up of individual inner evidence-based interventions to optimize in this case, engagement, but I would argue in general, uh, um, sort of public health outcomes of interest and concern. Um, 
um, and the reason why, and, the, and there are certain questions that come to the fore when you think, when the scientific focus becomes on how to combine, how to assemble, um, how to engineer different interventions together. Um, number one, time comes into focus. So what the effect of what one does now might depend on what was offered before. Um, and, and therefore, um, you know, strategies such as es escalating, switching, augmenting, um, um, you know, become, become critical. Um, and, and such sort of escalation or de-escalation approaches um, have, have potential benefits on a population level because, you know, it could minimize interventions for whom uh, something light touch is sufficient, thereby um, optimizing efficiency, but also intensification for those who need more, um, therefore optimizing kind of effectiveness. Um, um, and, and, and so adaptive interventions are things that, that do this, right? So these are things that um, are, are, are strategies that are based on patient response. Something is offered, a patient, a patient or a community or a clinic for that matter may or may not respond, and then that determines what comes next. I mean, if everything works, then you continue. If things um, don't work well, then you can consider a different sort of set of strategies. Um, and, um, um, you, you know, sort of well-suited for situations where you do have some evidence-based interventions, but you would want to assemble them to achieve maximal effectiveness in the population over time. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause. I'm not sure that uh, all, all of the sort of uh, points here are, um, I know some of them I may have gone over too quickly, um, but in case there are any questions, uh, I don't see any at the moment um, uh, before I jump into sort of the research methods for studying these. We, we do have one question. Yes. Um, and I, I'm happy to read it. Do the factors, gender and age, play significant role in retention in HIV services? Um, they, they, they do play some, some role, yes. Uh, and that's an important question. I think, <clears throat> you know, um, there is uh, an observation in, in, in HIV, but also in health service utilization in general that men tend to be kind of like less retained uh, than women, and and that that is sometimes, um, you know, that's like one of those observations that is um, <laughs> fairly ubiquitous, uh, you know, um, and across socioeconomic uh, levels or countries. Um, but but like the things we talked about, in in my view, those those differences tend to be small. Um, so. In, in, in many places, sort of women are retained in care better than men, but it's, you know, something like 5% at a year, maybe like 8% at two years or something like that. Um, so that's true. Um, um, and I think with retention, you know, uh, I think it's widely been observed also that younger people, that youth and young people uh, have uh, more challenges with, with staying in, in care um, as well. And the um, the ask the original poster buffer um, is following up saying um, because I live in Swaziland which has the highest rate of HIV prevalence and they usually find young people hesitant to access HIV services. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I so many many folks do kind of research on engaging um, adolescents and young people and. Uh, that's not an area that I'm terribly expert in, but I do recognize that it's a challenge, you know, and young people face particular challenges. There are issues around schools. Um, there are, the school is a place uh, where a stigma uh, can be particularly um, intense if, uh, if, you know, status is known. Um, schools also have rigid schedules sometimes that get in the way of, of making clinic visits. Um, there is a uh, widespread belief that young people are more um, risk, are, 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 are greater, or more likely to take risks. Um, I don't know to how well that bears out in the scientific literature, but I think there is some truth to that. 
Um, but but I think yeah, um, part of part of what um, retention work needs to do is to is to focus um, on what makes uh, the healthcare environment accessible and friendly to 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 young people. Um, the the rest of this talk doesn't focus particularly on that, but you know there are things like you know adolescent friendly days in clinic, right? Where where uh, the adolescents come in, the healthcare workers have been given particular training in how to talk to and how to engage adolescents uh, and young people. <clears throat> um, um, there are interventions that try to use peer and social norms um, to influence behavior and stuff like that. But um, yeah, thank you for your 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 question. And then there's just some follow on conversation about just general um, for the general population stigma and social beliefs and how um, at the beginning of the HIV, HIV epidemic um, those were barriers to to um, getting care yeah. and if and yeah I think go ahead. no no go ahead I was just saying yeah are those still in effect today um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, so um, there is a very robust uh, sort of research um, um, uh, enterprise around stigma, and in particular around stigma and HIV. And I think that um, there have been um, many attempts to try and find ways to, to either ameliorate stigma, to address it, to reduce it, uh, both at a societal level and, and at a personal level, and also in healthcare services. Um, um, for those of you who um, there are interested in this, I mean, Helen Epstein's book, The Invisible Cure from many, many years ago, still uh, resonates, even though it was um, quite some time since it was published, but it's, it's, it's a book about um, social capital and stigma and comparing Uganda and South Africa in the HIV epidemic, um, where she, she contends that you know, stigma plays a huge role in, in how society responds to, to um, to infectious diseases in general, but in to, to HIV in particular. So, um, but I think I think that it's the sense of many folks that stigma still exists, but is less has diminished since the early days. Um, the widespread availability of treatment, you know, uh, the 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 fact that many people living with HIV are sort of healthy, going about their lives as normal, um, achieving their goals in life, and 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 things like that um, help to diminish. The, the stigma um, and and makes 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 the 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 viewpoint or the the hope that you know life living with HIV uh, if well treated is should not does not have to be different than 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 um, than it would have been. Uh, I think that helps diminish the the stigma that's attached to it. And there's one more question. Um, is there any connection with adverse reactions from ART? To, um, well, um, I'm gonna <clears throat> um, sort of finish out the, the talk with this, this thing about this design, but I think that, um, um, you know, I think side effects um, are one of those things, well, side effects are certainly a, a reality for any medication. Um, as the as time has gone on, sort of toxicities and side effects from from HIV medications have diminished markedly, and um, and in fact, um, you know, you could say that there's sort of a second revolution in antiretroviral therapy, uh, sort of from 2010 onward. You know, whereas the first sort of revolution was the advent in the mid 90s, be because the medications became increasingly uh, less and less toxic, easier and easier to take. Um, 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 to the point where, you know, I think <clears throat> certainly attention needs to be paid to it, but um, the average person starting an average regimen today really does not have a whole lot in the way of sort of, 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 of side effects. So um, not, not the fearsome sort of uh, component of treatment that it was maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Um, yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> Let me just finish this up quickly here. Um, so the 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 um, the sequential multiple assignment 
uh, randomized trial is is a is a design that is well suited for developing and testing adaptive interventions for longitudinal problems that have no sort of silver bullet. And and in this study design, um, what you do is you give you randomize people to sort of what you give first, and then you decide. Some some criteria of whether or not there's success, and then you, um, um, if people are not succeeding with what you are offering, then you offer something else, um, and and this sequence of things um, yields a number of different strategies or pathways for addressing a longitudinal um, problem such as retention. So, for um, you know for for retention in HIV care these longitudinal sort of strategies that could be tested with a, a smart um, include things like offer an SMS message. If they miss a visit, then offer a navigator. Um, but if they make all their visits, stop the SMS. Um, or another one could be offer a conditional cash transfer. If the patient misses a visit, switch to a navigator, et cetera. Um, you can see that there are many permutations with just a few, a small number of, of inter potential individual evidence-based interventions. Um, to return to the case, the kinds of questions that one could answer with a uh, with a smart are, are not things like, you know, does an SMS help people stay in care, but um, but but a sort of a <clears throat> a number of other more nuanced sort of considerations. So as we look at her case, we could say, well, maybe a conditional cash transfer for making the the clinic visits would have helped her avoid that missed visit and therefore never triggered a set of bad interactions. But maybe a missed visit would happen sooner or later anyway, and it's really the interaction after the missed visit that matters in the long run. You know, um, on the other hand, uh, people could say, you know, um, a conditional cash transfer undermines the quote unquote intrinsic desire to get healthcare. And so um, if you were to give it, then maybe when you stop it, people will do bad, badly. Um, but on the other hand, there are psychological um, sort of um, theories that suggest that maybe conditional cash transfers would create habits, and therefore those habits would be uh, long-lasting or even potentiate later interventions. Um, but these are the types of, of questions that perhaps this sort of, that these kinds of study designs can, can offer. So we, we have a study that's recently completed um, with my colleagues um, in Kenya. <clears throat> looking at these three interventions, sort of SMS messages, conditional cash transfers, and pure navigators, all of which have um, sort of evidence to support them. Um, and we assembled them in this way. So patients were randomized to routine educational counseling, um, an SMS message, or a voucher um, up front. And then if they were not retained, they were re-randomized to outreach, which is sort of standard of care, where they look briefly for the patient, an SMS plus a voucher or a navigator. Um, in, and that is true no matter which arm you were randomized to at the first stage. <clears throat> now, if you received a, an active first stage intervention, whether that's SMS messages or the voucher, and you are retained, meaning that you miss no visits in the first year, um, you are then randomized to discontinue the, the voucher or the, the SMS. And so what this leaves us with is, um, th is this kind of a study design gives you not, not only you know, a number of embedded um, sort of point treatment randomized trials, but also a number of, of strategies. And in fact, there are 15 strategies embedded in this trial. Um, and here's like uh, the red is for example, one strategy. Routine education and counseling, if not retained, outreach, if retained, continue. The blue is another one. Uh, start with an SMS message. If they're retained, continue. If they're not retained, escalate to a voucher. Uh, you know, the green uh, is yet another example. But if you go through this carefully, um, you can see that there are 15 um, sort of embedded strategies uh, contained. So, um, you know, we, 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 we worked uh, with, um, colleagues at the Family AIDS Care and Educational Services Program in Kisumu uh, to do this in five facilities in Nyanza, uh, looking at retention and viral suppression as the outcomes. Um, and, um, oops. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, have, have been able to explore some of these questions 
uh, about you know what's the best strategy for intensifying, what are the effects of de-intensifying, and and what combination yields the most overall engagement. Um, and related to some of the questions that we're being that were asked, these things can be um, can be subgrouped by patient characteristics, uh, age, sex, um, and or other features um, to see whether or not these effects are consistent uh, across different sort of age groups. Okay, this brings me near to the end. Um, oh, I have a series of, 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 of slides here that are more technical and my, my one and I, um, you know, uh, just go over these quickly there from a, from a research methods point of view, there are a number of different questions that sometimes get asked. Um, and without belaboring the details here, you know, people will say like, so why not just conduct two randomized trials or three instead of putting them all together in one. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there, there are reasons for this. Um, the chief of which is that if you are curious about intervention effects that depend on what came before, then it's very difficult to do that in separate randomized trials. You, you would have to do it in, in one. Um, and for those of you who um, might be interested in some of these me methods, the, the idea of what the tailoring variable is, like how you decide what when success is reached or when non-success is reached and how do you decide when and what threshold to escalate uh, is an important methodological consideration. Um, um, a question often comes up for adaptive interventions. What, what, why don't you sort of just give people what they want instead of saying, you know, should you get this and then that? Why don't you just ask people, would you like this or would you like that? And I think the answer to that is that, the, you know, if the preference is the driver of, of effectiveness, then yes, you, you can just give people what they want. But oftentimes preferences are not perfectly aligned with, with, with effects. Um, you know, and as an example, um, maybe many people would choose a conditional cash transfer over a counselor, but um, it's not a foregone conclusion that that means that that is a better intervention for retention. Um, but let me just, um, I think, end with this thought here. Um, um, for both retention and HIV care, but other elements other types of public health problems that have a longitudinal component. Um, it, is, it, is it possible to conceive of public health practices somewhat personalized, recognizing that it can't perhaps respond to the idiosyncratic preferences and needs of every single person being sort of a public health uh, um, situation? But, um, but if, 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 if the types of services that are offered are at a minimum pegged on the response of patients, then, um, then perhaps uh, if that can be sort of um, implemented on a, on a wider basis, uh, that, that could help us get somewhat closer to, to practice that um, meets the needs of individuals um, while also sort of doing more with, with, with less um, by, by not overburdening those who don't need it with, with a set of activities. Um, um, that um, perhaps wouldn't be helpful. So, um, you know, in our research group, we've been thinking a little bit about whether or not these methods, you know, allow us to conceive of a, a, a more personalized sort of public health approach. Um, I think I'm at the hour. So uh, let me just end with, um, this is a photograph of our sort of study team um, in Kenya um, and uh, uh, Dr. Bakusi to the far left there. Um, and my colleague, um, Dr. O'Dani, uh, on the far right, and um, a, a, a study team um, for this this uh, study. All right. Well, let me let me end there. Um, thank you all, and uh, I hope that we do have a moment here to discuss and chat a little bit, um, um, and eager to hear what folks think. Aha! And now I see the chat. Yeah, I think we've gone through all the questions that have been posted so far. Great.
Well, while we're waiting for the audience to chime in, one thing that I was curious about, this was the first time I'd ever seen some of the, the data that you showed. There really is quite a difference in the curves related to uh, life expectancy in, in various countries. Um, and I, I'm curious, like if, if you contrast Botswana to Kenya, it's, it's really startling. Um, for someone who has no exposure to, to this information, what do you attribute that difference to? <clears throat> um, the the present day difference or the or the dip during the uh, the nineties because in 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 the nineties when when life expectancy fell I mean I think throughout um, Africa the 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 the, the um, sort of HIV prevalence um, even in in a relatively endemic regions sort of varied quite a bit um, and so you know I think um, um, uh, in uh, particularly in, in countries in southern Africa. Botswana and and others um, where the prevalence was 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 higher. Uh, I think that led in part to the the further sort of dip in the in the life expectancy. Um, but yeah, I mean those curves speak to two things. Number one, um, sort of where how 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 much of an impact HIV has, but um, both in terms of sort of how um, how much mortality could be attributed to it, but also also just the the level of um the the prevalence um in 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 certain places uh, at the time <clears throat> and we do have a couple questions um let's see dr fred dr fred thanks you i think he has to pop off <laughs> uh, he's also away um and can you see the other question? Oh, there's a couple. So uh, among strategies for retention in HIV services, what are the place of community-based interventions and family-focused interventions? Yeah, um, good question. In this particular study, we kind of focused on things that one might deliver at the clinic level rather than kind of like um, maybe structural or, or, or architectural changes to the delivery system itself. Which I think is a really important area of of, of research, but you know, um, um, in the in the global HIV treatment um, world right now, there's a, there's this big emphasis on so-called differentiated service delivery models, right? The idea that um, that different groups of patients might need different things, they might need different levels of contact with frequency with the to the clinic, they might. Some people might not want to come to the clinic and just collect their drugs, you know, at a pharmacy or a mobile clinic, um, and so there are a, a number of these sort of architectural um, innovations uh, in, in the field. And then, um, you know, I think the focus on on, on the family. There are uh, um, there are a number of different sort of there are there are days focused on kind of um, um, sort of you know clinics have. <clears throat> certain days where they're focused on particular types of patients and also for families to to, to go to clinic together um, but but there there are i think many sort of um, interventions in this realm um, not all of which i'm familiar with but uh, in, know that there's a lot of active research in that area <clears throat> <clears throat> great and we do we'll have one maybe time for one more question um, are there any qualitative issues you find in HIV retention um, across Africa? Many people combine indigenous medications and ARVs. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. I think, you know, one one thing, um, a number of folks that I know uh, or or have been in contact with or have read work <clears throat> have explored the intersection between the sort of Western biomedicine and, and traditional um, care in medicine, and um, you know, there's a there's a there's sort of a, a movement um, to try and not have, you know, sort of biomedicine say, okay, like what you're doing is 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 wrong, but but rather let's like work together because in truth, you know, a lot of times when patients have a problem, the first thing they do is they go to the traditional healer, and so, you know, sometimes they they that's where people seek advice. That's the, the the community member that they trust. That's the community member that they have the most access to. And 
um, there are sort of um, quite a there's quite a bit of innovative thinking about you know how to how to work together with traditional healers rather than like say you know you've got to do it this way and you can't talk to those traditional healers and stuff like that. So I think that's an important um, area of of research. <clears throat> Okay, and, and, and with that, I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Gang, for an excellent um, talk. This was very informative, and I, as you can see, our audience really enjoyed it and, and a, lot of, a, a lot of questions. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I will, will, will be sending an evaluation out to our audience, so, so please keep an eye on that. Um, and then I have two plugs. One is our upcoming um, event in April, our next um, speaker series, where we will have uh, Professor Penina Kyle L Laker, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts. It will be April 13th from 12.30 to 1.30 Central Time. I would also like to put a plug for our upcoming virtual Smart Africa conference. Laura just um, put the link on the chat if you guys are interested. Um, please visit our iChat website to learn more about our conference. It will be April 21st and 22nd. Um, and we will have wonderful speakers and, um, and, and keynote speakers from WHO, UNICEF. Um, so we would, we would love to um, see you at our conference as well. Um, so with that, I wish everyone a wonderful week and thank you again very much, Dr. Gang. Um, uh, we'll see you soon again. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gang. Thanks, everybody. I hope to see you at another open classroom very soon. Please stay healthy and safe out there. Bye now.